Thanks for having me here today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the changes in the way people perceive and measure time in Great Britain during the Industrial Revolution, um, specifically looking at uh, the difference between uh, the earlier way of, of sort of perceiving time of local time, uh, which was measured by the sundial in each town, to uh, a national uniform standard of branch mean time. So I want to begin by talking about um, uh, sort of uh, our contemporary viewpoint of this of this change sort of begins with E.B. Thompson, who's pictured above there, uh, a British historian who uh, wrote a paper who, where he basically argued that industrial capitalism fundamentally reoriented people's relations with time, saying that uh, it sort of switched to this abstract system of hours and wages. Uh, and a lot of historians have built on and modified his work. Um, I was first introduced to this difference between local time and and the sort of Greenwich Mean Time and National Time Zones in the book uh, Time Lord. And this is one of many books um, and many different historians who basically say that as soon as the railroads came in, um, Greenwich Mean Time and then time zones around the world sort of followed. Um, and it's a very technological story. It's the idea that railroads and telegraphs were it. And they led to this modern notion of time that we have now. Um, and the way, the problem with thinking about it this way is it sort of Give, lets the technology do the work for us. Um, the truth is that we make choices, um, and people in the 19th century made choices, and it led to the system we have now, and it wasn't simply the outside force of technology or some economic structure um, that did it. I'm going to argue today that it was actually the social norms and cultural assumptions held by Britons in the 19th century um, that shaped this transition from local time to a national uniform standard of Greenwich Mean Time, uh, and that it actually took a lot longer than you know, suddenly the railroads and the telegraphs coming in the 1840s and 50s, and suddenly we have Greenwich Mean Time. It actually continued all the way, um, this transition continued all the way to the 20th century. So to do that, I'm going to uh, uh, show you a little timeline, a uh, timeline of time reform in Great Britain. Uh, and uh, we're going to go from uh, this period of history from the late uh, 17th century, uh, which is when uh, clocks and watches became a lot cheaper. Um, all the way up through the early 20th century. Um, and so uh, I'm going to begin by looking at uh, this fellow here, uh, Christian Huygens, who invented the pendulum clock, which made um, clocks much more accurate and cheaper. Um, a series of innovations were followed after. And for the first time, not only the aristocracy and, and royalty could afford clocks, but now uh, the new middle classes could actually afford um, clocks, and especially pocket watches um, became a really important status symbol. Um, and so we'll come back to this, but just keep this in mind. Um, where I really kind of want to start is um, with the line clock letters, what I'm calling the line clock letters. Um, so in 1908, um, a, uh, uh, a man sent a letter to uh, the Times of London basically saying, the clocks in London are all wrong. They don't say Greenwich Mean Time, they have this sort of inaccurate, um, uh, they all disagree with each other, all the public clocks are wrong, and we have to change this, this isn't right. And the, the Times responded with an editorial, and then there were a number of other um, letters about this um, that basically show that um, these, all these people were saying, look, the clocks are wrong, they're lying clocks in London, um, and we need to fix this because this isn't a modern timekeeping system. And if you compare it to what's going on in Paris and Berlin, they have these modern electrical timekeeping systems, and how are we falling behind? Um, and what this shows is that this is, was not a matter of just the railroads and the telegraphs coming in in the 1840s and 1850s and the whole country changing. It, it took all the way up to the 20th century where you still had, in the capital of the British Empire, inaccurate timekeeping systems. And what comes up over and over again in these letters is the phrase, time is money, which you're probably familiar with. But they really took a sort of pride in this phrase because they said, this is our national problem. We invented this idea of time is money. And so, of course, we shouldn't be wasting all these financial resources on with this inaccurate timekeeping system. Um, and so what I want to suggest is that this idea of time is money, rather than being a reason that they should have a modern timekeeping system, was actually a limiting factor um, that slowed the transition um, from, Greenwich, from, from localized view of time to Greenwich Mean Time. Um, so I want to go back to looking at um, how we get this phrase, time is money. Uh, it's generally uh, attributed to Benjamin Franklin. It came before that, but he sort of popularized this term, time is money. Uh, in 1748, he wrote advice to a young tradesman where um, he said, uh, you should remember that time is money. Uh, and he goes into it very literally. He says, uh, think of a day that you spend idling away, um, you know, off drinking and gambling. 
not only should you take into account the, the money you're spending, whatever you're doing during that idle leisure time, you should also take into account that you're wasting a day that you could have earned wages and income for. So it's the literal idea of these hours are equivalent to time. Uh, so this phrase continues and becomes more and more popular um, throughout the uh, 19th century uh, until we get to uh, closer to our period of Greenwich Mean Time. And uh, Samuel Smiles, um, who's an important author in the Victorian era, wrote a book called Self Help, which is a very uh, popular book. And uh, he basically said, men of business are accustomed to quote the maxim that time is money. So this idea, uh, at this point, it's sort of commonplace. Men of, uh, men of business are accustomed to quote this. Um, it's, it, we can see why by the time we get to line clocks, um, it's become something of an African proverb, right? Um, but the, 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 the interesting thing here is how literally it was taken. Um, there were people who proposed uh, founding the entire British monetary system on the idea of time rather than because time is so valuable. Um, and for Greenwich Mean Time, the purposes of Greenwich Mean Time, we actually see time uh, sold as a sort of commodity. Um, so here we have the Greenwich Time Lady. Um, the Greenwich Time Lady was a woman who actually sold access to Greenwich Mean Time. She would set her clock uh, at the Royal Observatory at Greenwich each day and then go around to her clients who purchased access to looking at her watch <laughs> and setting her clocks by that watch. Um, so this should make us think of two things. First of all, this isn't just about technology. This is about the least technologically sophisticated way you can think of going to Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, so it's not just about that. The second thing is we're literally selling Greenwich Mean Time for money. Uh, and it wasn't just her, it was also the post office was selling um, telegraphic time signals. Um, and there was a private company called the Standard Time Company that was doing this. Um, and certainly for railway corporations uh, and for banks and things like businesses like that, um, they felt that they needed access to Greenwich Mean Time for the efficient coordination of their business. But think about it, like if you're actually selling Greenwich Mean Time, access to Greenwich Mean Time, how are you going to get to have a new national uniform standard? Because that implies that everyone needs to buy uh, Purchase, purchase access to this, to this standard. And that means that we have to assume that everyone wanted access to this standard. But um, as we see, it's not actually the case that everyone agreed that this is the way we should go. Not everyone had an equal interest in this. Certainly, Greenwich Mean Time had applications for like the railroads, yes. But um, as soon as uh, we get Greenwich Mean Time adopted by the railroads, there's a debate about what constitutes true time. And in Blackwood's Edinburgh Magazine, in 1848, um, there's an editorial that appears that vociferously attacks um, the imposition of Greenwich Mean Time on Edinburgh, saying that it's a foul conspiracy to deprive uh, Scotsmen of uh, 11 minutes extra bed rest. Because <laughs> apparently, because there's an 11 minute difference uh, in, the, in, in the longitudes between Edinburgh <laughs> and Greenwich. And so this is a, a, a basically a conspiracy by the railway corporations and the town council of Edinburgh to basically tell the sun when to rise and set. And only God can do that, right? And so this is sort of a, a, a it was a, an extreme variation of this. But you see this over and over again in, in the newspapers at the time, making a distinction between true local time and national, a national standard of Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, and you can even see it in the literature of the period. Um, Edwin Waugh wrote a short story called Oliver Friendly's Watch that was popular in the period. He was called the poet of Lancashire. And in this story, the main character, Oliver Friendly, he gets rid of his watch, because he, his pocket watch, because it used to be sort of status for him, but he realizes it's more of a source of anxiety than anything else. And he doesn't really like it anymore. And when he does get rid of it, the problem that comes up in the story is he goes to visit a friend, and when he's supposed to go home, he misses the train. So is there this, there's this direct connection in the story of the idea of timekeeping to we need to catch trains, right? And it, by the end of the story, his friend ends up getting an old watch and it doesn't work and he finds it uh, amusing and ends up deciding he's friends with this watch and all this. So it's kind of this ridiculous idea, but the satire is that you shouldn't really be governing your lives around timekeeping watches and around the train, catching trains. Um, and so it kind of de demonstrates this idea that not everyone felt we needed to go to this national standard and govern our lives around what the trains needed, right? And so that presents a problem if you're selling uh, time, French mean time for money. Time is money becomes a problem um, for the adoption of the standard. Um, and so when they wrote this idea that time is money, obviously we should have a modern timekeeping system, they were, how, we, how do we not? They were kind of answering their own question by bringing up this uh, cultural assumption that was very important in shaping the ways this transition actually happened. 
Um, and so I think what we should take away from this, what we should learn from this, is that anytime there's a transition or there's a new technology that leads to that causes us to consider changes, or that we're trying to make a change in our society, we should really examine the way we view the world, the, the like cultural assumptions we have. Because something like time is money, we still have it, and it, ha it has very limited applications. True, you can say it for like a day, uh, yes, in a day, certain hours are worth a certain amount to you. But can you say it for the period of time we've just talked about, what is that worth? What is 250 years worth? What is the last, you know, the period of time that we all study, the last 5,000 years of human history. What is that worth? Is that, can you translate that, that into time? How about the last 5 million years of human evolution? Time is a lot bigger. It's actually 13.7 million years since the Big Bang. It's <laughs> and the idea that you can just reduce that into time as money is really a difficult thing. And I think we need to keep that in mind whenever we're trying to make a transition to a better tomorrow, is that our cultural assumptions can really have a limiting factor on that. Uh, so thank you very much.